Good evening. Welcome to Trinity Baptist Church Wednesday night the Bible study. We are uh, going to begin something new tonight and a new series, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But before we uh, get started and go any further, I'd like to make a couple of announcements to you, and uh, and this is mainly for our church folks, uh, the church family. Listen carefully. Uh, we're working on an idea of how we can have a drive-in church service for Sundays, for Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. Uh, I'm in the process now of, of getting a, uh, an FM transmitter for the church, and uh, they're not very expensive at all, and uh, we're going to try to set that up and so that we can have uh, a service here at the church, but outside instead of coming into the building. And I'll work out the details with you uh, as we get a little closer. It won't be this Sunday. It will probably be, hopefully, if all goes well and the Lord blesses this, it'll be the first Sunday of May. So two Sundays from now. So we'll see how it goes. I'll keep you informed. I'll tell you more this Sunday about it. I'm still working on the idea, but uh, I think it would be beneficial for our church if we were able to meet uh, even if it is in the parking lot, everyone staying in their cars, uh, parking you know a few feet away from each other, and keeping our distance, everybody uh, everybody staying safe. But I think it'd be good for our church. I think it'd be good for you folks, and and would be good for for my wife and I for sure. And I just think it would be good. And uh, I've I believe the Lord's been working on my heart about this thing of not meeting at all. So uh, we'll work it out with you. If uh, any, of the, any of the church family would like to text me or call me about this uh, after you've seen the video from, from tonight, uh, feel free to call and, and we'll chat about it or send a text or whatever you want, email, whatever you want to do. And uh, I'd like to hear from you about this. So uh, if, uh, if you don't call me, I'm going to call you. So I uh, hope you'll get in touch with us and uh, give us your feedback on this. But I really feel like it's something we should do not trying to cause any problems with authorities or anything like that. Uh, we'll, we'll abide by the rules as much as we possibly can uh, and, and try to keep everybody safe. That's our main goal. We don't want, to, don't want to do anything to endanger anybody or cause anybody to get sick. So uh, that, that being said, I, I, I hope that you will consider it, pray about it, and uh, ask the Lord to help us have wisdom in knowing how to set this up and get it working. And uh, you'll be able to come park in the parking lot. Uh, we'll ask you to, we'll, when you come in, we'll ask you to park in certain places in a certain order. And, uh, and we'll have somebody there to direct you to show you where to park so that uh, then you'll be able to turn on your radio to a certain frequency on your FM radio in your car. And we'll be able to, uh, have a service that way, be able to have some special singing uh, that will be there uh, right before you, probably on the carport in front of the church um, or something like that. And you'll be able to listen on your radio, uh, but you'll be there in person. And I, th I think it'll be helpful. So um, give me some feedback, church family. I'd sure like to hear from you about it. All right. Uh, Let's pray, and we'll get started in this new series that we're very excited about starting tonight. Thank you so much, Father, for your word, and thank you for your Holy Spirit to guide us step by step in this life. Thank you for our dear folks, our church family that we love and care about so much, and, and maybe others who, who might be watching the video now uh, that we don't even know, but Lord, I pray that you would work in each heart, each life, each person who uh, is part of this study. Help us, Lord, to teach your word according to your power and your wisdom. Don't, please don't let me mess it up. Please don't let me say or do anything that would distract from your word. I pray that we will listen to you and obey you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the series we're going to do is something we have done in the church before, but it's been a few years ago, and it was the, uh, the letters of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. We're actually going to do a verse-by-verse -verse study all the way through 1 Timothy and then 
following with 2 Timothy. I don't know how long this will take because it is a verse by verse study. We'll study every verse in these letters. And so I, I can't say how long it'll take. So it's we're in this one for the long haul, as they say. And I hope that you will uh, take part in this study, have your Bible ready, and we'll study together. And we'll learn uh, about the letter of 1 Timothy, and we'll see how God uses it in our lives. I've been praying about what to do for a while now, and I really feel led that the, God, the Lord would guide us and, and lead us to, to do this study. So uh, be ready for it. Tonight will be a little different, though. We won't be doing the verse-by-verse -verse study tonight because we're going to do an introduction to the letter. And the introduction is going to take, hmm, I don't know how long, maybe all of tonight's uh, lesson uh, and part of next week's. I don't know, but I'm going to try to finish it tonight if I can so I can begin the verse-by-verse -verse study next week. All right. Now, in an introduction to a verse-by-verse -verse study of a letter, we will ask certain questions and answer them. For example, the first question we're going to ask, since it is a letter from the Apostle Paul to the young preacher boy, the young pastor named Timothy, we're going to ask the question, who is Timothy? And then we're going to answer that. And we're going to use scripture to answer the questions. So the question, the first question is, who is Timothy or who was Timothy? And if you'll look, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 1, let's read the first two verses. You read along with me while I read out loud, okay? Verse 1, 1 Timothy 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul addresses Timothy as his own son in the faith. His own son in the faith. So that would be our first answer to the question. And this, this question, who was Timothy, is going to have many parts to the answer. The first part is, he was Paul's son in the faith, which probably means that Paul says this because he's the one who taught Timothy the gospel, and he uh, helped Timothy find the Lord. Now we're going to find out there were other people instrumental in, in Timothy uh, finding the Lord Jesus and being becoming a Christian, being saved, but we know that Paul must have had uh, a part in that. And, uh, and for no, if nothing else, we know that Paul was instrumental in taking Timothy under his arm or under his wing, as they say, and, and bringing him close to him and teaching him along the way as a young preacher and, uh, and guiding him and helping him learn. So that could be the meaning of uh, son and the faith in that sense as well. If you look over to 2 Timothy with me, we're gonna jump over there just for a moment. And, and get a, a, a glance at what he said here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace, from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, he calls him his son. And we know that he's talking about his spiritual son, his son in the faith. So that's the first answer. Second answer, who was Timothy? It's possible that Paul met Timothy when he was on his first missionary journey and he went through Lystra. And we'll see that in just a moment. We'll read some more. If you want to go ahead and find Acts chapter 16, that's where we're going next. And it, it's connected with this answer as well as, as the following. But uh, it's possible that Paul met Timothy when, during his first missionary journey when he went through Lystra. Okay? So that's uh, the second part to the answer, who was Timothy. The third part, Acts chapter 16. If you'll join, there, join me there in Acts 16, we're going to glance at 
uh, the actual event when Paul uh, came in contact with Timothy. That's what the book of Acts is about. The biggest part of it is, is showing when, uh, at least the second half of the, of the book, is showing when the Apostle Paul was traveling to different places, different churches, different cities, and establishing churches and, and ministering to these Christians, uh, the book of Acts tells us the details of those events. Well, here's this story of how he went to Lystra. Okay, Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 1. Acts 16, verse 1. Then came he to Derby and Lystra. He is Paul, of course. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed. But his father was a Greek. He wasn't a Jew. That's all it means. Verse 2, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. And it's all talking about Timothy, Timotheus, or Timotheus, or however you want to pronounce it. Um, but anyway, I'll pronounce it differently every time I say it, I'm sure. But anyway, Timothy, it says that he was the son of a certain woman, and this woman was a Jew or Jewess who believed. So she's a believing Jew. She's a saved Christian Jewish woman. She's married to a man who's not Jewish. He is a Greek, all right? He's a Gentile. But look carefully what it says in verse 2 about Timothy, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. He had a good testimony, all right? He had a good testimony. He's well reported of. Wouldn't that be wonderful if each of us could hear that we have a testimony before others, that the people in the, your community, the people where you work, people where you shop, uh, the people where you buy your gas, the people where uh, in your neighborhood, your neighbors around you, they would say you are well reported of as a believer. Wouldn't that be a blessing? We should all strive to have that testimony. And I hope everybody listening to me will make that a goal in your life that you will not just, um, not just strive to please the Lord, that's first, but also when you're pleasing the Lord, he's going to cause you to have favor with others and he's going to give you a good testimony before others. We should always, always try to be a good testimony because it's the name of Jesus that we represent before others and we need to make sure that we do a good job with that. So, it shows here that in verses 1 and 2, Acts 16, verses 1 and 2, that Paul uh, came in contact with Timothy there in Lystra. And uh, let's see here. Wait just a minute. I, had, I forgot to look at my notes. I, I got myself ahead of myself here. When Paul came to Lystra in Acts chapter 16, if I'm not mistaken, and I hope I'm correct on this, I, I, I could be wrong because I've... I've let myself get lost in my in my notes. I believe this time in Acts 16 was Paul's second journey, not his first. So I'll, I'll try to straighten that out later. But either way, we, we believe that Paul met Timothy there in Lystra when he passed through. All right, the fourth answer, who was Timothy? All right, his mother was a Christian Jew. His father was a Greek. You know, when people ask, who are you? Where are you from? Uh, when you introduce yourself to a, to a, a stranger for the first time, sometimes they, they say, oh, uh, those Johnsons. Uh, I know some Johnsons. Are you part of that family from down there and over across the mountain or, or somewhere down the road? And they, they, they connect you with your family. Well, Timothy was very closely connected to his family. Not just his mother, but also his father. And uh, we, as, as you study about Timothy's life and his travel with the Apostle Paul, uh, his father being a Greek, not being a Jew, uh, had a big impact on him later. And, uh, and, and it caused some Jews to question him. But we won't get into that, into that for now. We'll, we'll deal with that some other time. But his mother was a Jew 
who believed. She was a Christian. And that's the part we're going to learn more about in just a few minutes. All right, we'll, we'll come back to that. All right, the fifth answer to Paul being, or who is, who is Timothy? Number five, Paul writes about Timothy's mother and grandmother and how they were faithful Christians. If you'll look with me over to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Paul said, and he said this to Timothy as he's writing to him, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, or Eunice, you say that the way you want, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. Unfeigned faith. Unfeigned faith. That's a wonderful compliment and a great attribute to have in the Christian life is to have a faith that's unfeigned. It's not weak. It doesn't falter. You're not a hot and cold Christian. You're not an up and down Christian. Uh, up one day and down the next. No. Consistent, unfeigned faith. A goal for all of us to try to reach. Every day we should strive to have a faith that doesn't falter, doesn't trip, doesn't, uh, doesn't get tripped up. You're consistent in your faith, in your trust of the Lord every day. And that's what Timothy's mother and grandmother, the way they lived and the way they lived for God in front of Timothy and taught him that. Jump over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Go down to verse... 14, Paul admonishes, he encourages Timothy to do exactly that, to follow the example of his mother and grandmother. And he says in uh, chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, verse 14, verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Look carefully, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Look at the verse again. Let's read it one more time. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know, I have a desire, and I'm not sure I should follow it, but I'd like to just park right here and teach verse 15 because verse 15 is a wonderful verse that reminds me, adults, listen carefully. Don't ever be a hindrance to the children learning the scriptures. As a matter of fact, be an encouragement to them learning the scriptures. The Holy Scriptures will make you wise unto salvation. That's what Paul said it did for Timothy. You want your kids to be saved, not give their life to the devil? You want your children to grow up to live for God instead of Satan and waste their life in wickedness? You want your children to grow up and live for God and glorify him with their lives? Put the scripture in them. Show them. Don't just tell them what it says. Read it to them and then show them how to live it with your life. That's what we're to do as adults, as parents and grandparents. That is our duty. That is our duty given to us by God that we, sh we should set that example for the kids. The children should have somebody to follow who sets a good example. Because I'm going to tell you something. They're either going to follow your example or they're going to follow somebody else's. But they're going to follow somebody. It's human nature. Children will follow somebody. Try to make sure that it's you and your godly example that they follow, not the bad example. And the best way to do that is teach them the scriptures, 
practice the scripture in your life so you can show them the scriptures and how it lives through you. Do that. You'll never be sorry for any time you invested into that. You'll always be glad that you invested your life into your kids and your grandkids. Now, Timothy's name, this is the, the sixth part, if I'm, if I'm counting correctly, the sixth part to the answer, who was Timothy? Timothy's name has a special meaning, as names in the Bible do, just like your name and my name, they have, they have uh, meanings. Well, Timothy's name means honoring God, honoring God. Now, his mother and father named him with that name, and I believe it was for a reason. I don't know how much influence his mother had in the name, but it sound, sure sounds like there was some kind of influence there that was godly, doesn't it? Because his name meant honoring God. And I, uh, I tend to believe that Timothy's mother influenced the father to name this boy Timothy because she knew what the name meant. And maybe, maybe dad, maybe this Greek father uh, became a believer later. We don't know. We're not told any more about his father. But I hope he did. But uh, having a godly woman in the house, having a godly mother, a godly wife, makes all the difference. So ladies, be faithful to God. Whether your husband is faithful or not, you be faithful. And you see the result in Timothy's life of a faithful mother and then the grandmother as well, influencing this young man for God. Number seven, who was Timothy? Timothy traveled with the Apostle Paul to several cities as they preached the gospel. All right, we'll show you more about that in just a minute. But Timothy traveled with the Apostle Paul to several cities as they preached the gospel. This was after they met, and Timothy started traveling with Paul to certain places and started letting God lead him in the ministry and serving God and sharing the gospel and going to different cities and encouraging Christians and and the small churches that were just getting started. Remember, we're in, the, we're in the first century. We're in the first generation of Christians after Jesus. The first generation. And these are people who have, uh, the Jews who have come out of Old Testament worship and they're offering sacrifices at the altar of the temple and, and going through that to come to God. And now they, there's a transition period that the book of Acts teaches us about. And, and this first generation of believers are hearing about Jesus Christ who came and died on the cross to pay for their sins, was buried in the grave and arose three days later and then ascended to heaven. And he's at the right hand of the Father and he's coming back for us someday soon. Paul and Timothy taught that to these people. The same gospel that we, we have in our Bible today and that we believe is the same thing Paul and Timothy taught the people there when they traveled to different cities. Number eight, who was Timothy? Paul also sent Timothy on several crucial missions to help congregations of believers overcome spiritual difficulties. Now, the reason I went into detail explaining to you about who these new Christians are and this new generation of believers is because they faced great opposition. They faced great tribulation and, and uh, persecution from non-believing Jews, from Gentiles, the, the Greeks and the Romans and other Gentiles who, who didn't believe, who followed pagans and false uh, idols, and they were persecuted greatly in this first generation especially. And, uh, and Paul sent Timothy to go to certain churches and certain groups of Christians and certain cities and teach them how to deal with these difficulties and how to get through them. Let me sh let's just look at a few. Let's look at a few times that Timothy went. First Corinthians, okay? The city of Corinth. City of Corinth in Asia Minor. First Corinthians chapter 4. The city, the church at Corinth, the Christians at Corinth uh, they had some problems. Many of them were believers in this, in this church there. The, the, the born-again believers formed the church, and many of them were sincere and followed God, but 
they really got tripped up into some false teachings. They tried to mix uh, the worship of their idols with, with the worship of God and Jesus. They tried to mix the worship uh, from the Old Testament uh, and, and mix that with following Jesus as well. And the two don't mix, folks. The Old Testament has its place, and we, we love the Old Testament and all of that, but the law had its purpose to bring us to God, to show us that we need God. And then Jesus brought grace so that we could be saved, so that we could be forgiven. And Paul sent Timothy to these places to teach him about that, to teach the people how to overcome these difficulties. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, go down to verse 17. Verse 17. For this cause have I sent unto you, and he's talking to the Christians at Corinth, have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. He's telling them, I'm sending Timothy to you because he's going to remind you, he's going to bring you into remembrance, he's going to remind you of the things that I teach. Timothy taught the same thing that Paul taught. And he said, I, he said I'm sending him to you to bring you into remembrance of these things, the, my ways, the way Paul lived for Christ, and as I teach everywhere in every church, the same thing that Paul taught. So he's, he's helping the church at Corinth, this troubled church. He's helping them uh, to, to overcome their difficulties by sending Timothy there to teach them. Go over to uh, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's just, I was going to start at another verse, but let's start at verse 1. Let's see, let's see a little bit of the context um, as Paul is telling the, the Corinth, the uh, Thessalonica, I'll get it in a minute, the Christians at Thessalonica, he's teaching them and, and he's, he's telling them about Timothy. Verse 1, chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 1. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, and you have to read the verses before that to find out what he's talking about, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. Then he says, verse 2, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Go down to verse 3. That no man should be removed, or excuse me, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, the persecution they were going through, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. He says, you know that Christians are going to be persecuted. We're appointed to that. All right? And he says, he tells them in verse 3 that no man should be moved by these afflictions. He sent Timothy there to tell them, don't let your troubles get you sidetracked. Don't let it get you down. Stay faithful. Stay true to God. So he sent Timothy to the church at Thessalonica. He went to Corinth. And he's in Thessalonica. Now, let's go down to Philippians because we find out that he sent Timothy to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 19. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. Verse 19 reads, But I trust in the Lord, uh, excuse me, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. 
For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him, proof of Timothy, that as a son with the Father, he hath served me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, as soon as I shall see how it will go with me. Paul is there in Philippi, and he said he tells them in uh, excuse me, Paul is he's I forget where he is. I'll have to read back and find out where he is. I don't remember. But he's telling them, church Christians at Philippi, I'm going to send Timothy to you very soon. But as you read this letter, you know that I'm going through some things here and I don't know how it's going to turn out. So I want, I'm going to keep Timothy with me just until I see how it's going to go. But as soon as I can, I'm going to send him with to you because he is faithful. And look at verse 20. For I have no man like-minded, means like-minded like Paul is, thinks like he does, who will naturally care for your state. There's, he said, I believe Timothy is the most faithful man I've got. He's the most faithful. He will naturally care for your state, for your condition, for what you're going through. He's going to come there to help you. And you know, that had to encourage the Philippians. Those Christians were going through great tribulation and persecution. As all of the churches, uh, the new churches in this first generation of Christians were going through great tribulation. All right, so let me, re let me refresh you on this last one we just went through. He sent Timothy to several congregations, several places to encourage the believers how to overcome their spiritual difficulties. He sent him to Corinth, sent him to Thessalonica, and he sent him to Philippi, all right? Now, number nine, who was Timothy? This is probably all I'm going to get done is just answer the question, who was Timothy, for tonight. But we'll try to hurry and get to the end of it. I'm almost finished with that part. Number nine, who was Timothy? Paul felt that no one had any compassion or commitment that compared to what Timothy had. We just read the verse, as, I, as we just read in, in Philippians chapter 2, that uh, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for you, care for your state. He didn't, Paul, I believe Paul was convinced that Timothy was the most faithful young man he had, and he had others who followed him as well, but he, he, he believed that Timothy had compassion and, and cared about people and was concerned for the Christians in Philippi and Thessalonica and Corinth, and he, that's why he sent him there. That's an important answer to the question, who was Timothy? He was a, a young preacher who cared. That's vital. A preacher who doesn't care, who just wants to yell and spit and preach and, and make a lot of noise, but he doesn't care about his people. He doesn't care about other people. He's useless. He's not a preacher. He shouldn't even be preaching if he doesn't care. Now, number 10. So close were Paul and Timothy that both their names are listed as the authors of six of Paul's letters. Six of Paul's letters to churches have the name Paul and Timothy together as uh, Timothy working with him in the, in the writing and sending of that letter. Now, it's, I'll give you a hint. It's chapter one and verse one of the letters I'm gonna mention to you. I'm gonna give you the list. First, chapter one, verse one of these letters. Second Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 1. Philippians, chapter 1, verse 1. Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. So that's, that, I think that's a wonderful answer. Who was Timothy that he and Paul were so close in the ministry that God would allow Timothy's name to be listed there with the Apostle Paul's uh, as sending the letter to those Christians. Number 11, uh, let's see here. Oh, it's the last one, the last answer of who was Timothy, okay. Number 11, the last answer. Paul also wrote two letters to Timothy as well. That adds to the list of who was Timothy. He's a, he's a young preacher that Paul wrote two letters to. 
didn't just Paul Timothy didn't just assist the Apostle Paul and work with him in the ministry and travel with him and go see churches and do all of those other things. But the Apostle Paul wrote two individual or personal ministry letters to the young preacher Timothy to encourage him, to teach him, to guide him in the ministry. I mean, those are First and Second Timothy, as you have already figured out. All right. Now, we've answered the question, who was Timothy? Another thing we do in introductions to a letter or to a book of the Bible when we study it, we find out when it was written, the date that this letter was written. And we have an approximate date. We don't know the exact date, but we can come pretty close. Uh, around 63 AD. Around 63. Now, how's your math? Can you calculate that? How many years is that approximately after Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and arose from the grave. 30 years, give or take a few years. 30 years after Jesus, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter. So just in your own mind, calculate and, and try to see the situation that Timothy and the Apostle Paul are dealing with. They're dealing with these people in that first 30 years of New Testament grace the age of grace new testament churches this brand new thing that god has ordained and set up they've left old testament worship that the law had its place the law has done its job it's brought everybody to see that they need god and god sent the savior his son jesus to rescue each of us and them from their sin and from the punishment of sin, which is eternity in hell. So about 63 AD, something like that, was when Paul wrote this first letter uh, to Timothy. Now, something interesting about Paul writing this letter to Timothy, Paul wrote this letter to Timothy while Timothy was doing ministry, was, was uh, ministering to Christians, but Paul, where was Paul? Paul was in prison in Rome. At first imprisonment, the first time he was in prison in Rome is when he wrote this letter to Timothy. And think about that. The Apostle Paul is being held in prison for preaching the gospel, and he writes a letter to young Timothy and encourages him to preach the gospel. Amen? That's the way we should all see it. Nothing should get us to stop. Nothing should, could cause us to stop, uh, should cause us to stop preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel with others. Now, so the date we've established, the next thing that we need to look at, what is the purpose of the letter? And that's very important when you want to study something in the Bible. You need to ask these questions, who, what, when, where, why, just like uh, trying to understand any other topic when you want to understand the letter or the, the part of the Bible you're studying, ask those questions. Well, why was it written? What's the purpose for this letter? Paul, this is the first answer, okay? Paul had hoped to visit Timothy in Ephesus, but was fearful or thinking he would be delayed, okay? If he were delayed, he wanted Timothy to know how to conduct and I'm going to say a word that I don't like to use, but I'm trying, I can't think of a better word right now. How to conduct the business of the local church. A local church is not a business, okay? It's a church. But I can't think of another. How do you conduct the, the, the running of the church? How do you conduct the church? Uh, and he's trying to teach Timothy how to handle himself as the pastor of a church. All right? How do you handle, how do you handle disagreements between Christians? Yes, Christians disagree sometimes. How do you handle decision-making uh, process of, of the congregation? And how do you teach people about sin in their life without making it look like you're condemning them because they're worse than you are, or you're better than them? Things like that. He's just teaching Timothy some good practical things that a young preacher needs to learn and that every preacher needs to learn. And uh, Paul is teaching him that, and he, and he wrote to Timothy about that. If you'll look in 1 Timothy with me, 1 Timothy chapter 3, 
Back to 1 Timothy. Let me find my place there. I've already turned and lost it. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, go down to verse 14 with me. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Paul said to Timothy in these words, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. What, what's he talking about, the house of God? He explains it, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I get encouraged, I get excited just reading those words. The local church, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Every local church ought to see itself that way. Every congregation that believes the gospel and trusts God for their lives and for their eternity needs to see that their local church is the ground, the pillar and ground of the truth. They ought to hold the truth dear. And the truth is right here in the Bible. It is the Bible. And they need to hold it dear and keep it pure and true and not let anything water it down or disturb it or destroy it. Amen? I hope you're saying amen sitting there listening to me. Please do. All right. I'm going to try to finish this tonight. I'm trying to turn pages because I'm on my last page. So stick with me and we're going to finish this quickly. All right. Uh, what is the purpose of the letter? To tell Timothy that Paul's coming, but he might be delayed, and how he's to conduct himself in the church. All right, that's, that's number one. Number two, the answer to uh, what's the purpose of the letter? This letter contains instructions concerning order and structure in the church and practical advice for this young pastor. Did you get that? This letter contains instructions concerning order and structure of the local church and practical advice for this young pastor. And that's very important. And that's why I, I think that every Christian, new Christian, mature Christian, no matter who you are, you need to study these letters, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and, and more that we're going to be studying later. But my favorite Excuse me. My favorite way to study and to teach the Bible is to study verse by verse, verse by verse. Not miss anything, not skip anything. Just do verse by verse because that's how God gave it to us, verse by verse. All right. The next question we're going to answer, and I think it's the last one. Yes, it's the last question we're going to answer in the introduction. What was the theme of the letter? We found out the purpose of the letter. Now, what's the theme of the letter? What's this letter about? 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and the letter to Titus, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and the letter to Titus, have become known as the pastoral epistles, letters that Paul wrote to preachers. The other letters Paul wrote were to, were to churches, to Christians, congregations. But 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, Paul wrote to two preachers, two young preachers, who had followed him, he had taught, and they'd been following him in the ministry, Timothy and Titus, and, and he wrote these, and they're called the pastoral epistles, the pastoral letters, all right? So that's a theme. That's part of the theme of these letters. They're for pastors. They're for preachers. But every, can I just say something? Every Christian, every saved person is a preacher. That's right. Every saved person is a preacher. A preacher is one who proclaims. Doesn't mean you pastor a church. Being a pastor is, is a different office that I'm talking about, a different position. But being a preacher is one who proclaims the gospel. To preach the gospel is to proclaim it. Every Christian has that duty. Duty, I said. Duty to proclaim the gospel. Share the gospel with everybody you can. All right? And these letters are very important for us to be reminded of that. Okay. Next answer, what was the theme of the letter? One of the main themes of, this, of these letters is sound teaching. Those two words, sound teaching. 
Sound meaning true teaching, solid teaching, thorough teaching. I'm sure you, you get it. But if I could give you a long list of 1 Timothy 1.10, 2 Timothy 1.7, 2 Timothy 1.13, and on and on and on. I've got about a dozen places where these words are, these words sound teaching or, or uh, uh, true teaching are used in, in this letter that Paul wrote to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. But, uh, but in these letters, Paul encourages these young preachers to keep their teaching sound, keep it true. You know, uh, I've been preaching now for, I don't remember, and looking at my wife asking, I don't remember how long we've been in the ministry. 1984? Maybe. 81? 80, uh, sometime in the early 80s. I don't remember exactly. I think it was 84. But sometime in there uh, is when God dealt with our hearts and put us in the ministry, you could say. And for, for these years that we've been in the ministry, uh, we've been learning constantly, always learning. My problem is trying to remember what I learned because I forget so quickly. But, but it's so important that we learn. And young preachers, young Christians need to learn. One mistake that a lot of young preachers especially, but almost all young people, and I'm not trying to be offensive to young people, but a lot of young people get the attitude that they already know everything. We kind of, I tease the teenagers and the young people of our church that they already know everything, but they know I'm kidding with them and trying to encourage them to be willing to learn. Well, I'm gonna encourage you, no matter how old you are or how young you are, that we always learn. So be willing to learn, especially young preachers. Don't ever think that you know enough that you don't need to learn some more, okay? So don't ever stop honing and protecting and keeping your teaching from the Word of God true and sound. You must keep it that way. And that's why Paul kept repeating this over and over to Timothy and Titus. Keep your teaching true. Keep it sound. Keep it thorough. Make sure it's scriptural. Make sure it agrees with the Bible and nothing else. All right? Now, the last answer of the theme of the letters, Paul urged Timothy and Titus to confront the false teaching in what way? One way. By sound teaching. Sound teaching. True Bible teaching is how you confront false doctrine. True Bible teaching is how you confront and put down false teaching. You don't do it by debating, by arguing. And that's the favorite way that most people I know want to deal with somebody they don't agree with in doctrine of something from the Bible. And they do it exactly the wrong way by arguing and debating, trying to outdo the other one with sentences and words and paragraphs that don't mean a thing. What's, what's the one way, the only way you can confront and defeat false teaching and false doctrine that is taught everywhere in this world today? By pure Bible. That's it. Pure Bible. That's how you defeat it. And that's what he told, Paul told Timothy and Titus, use sound scriptural teaching to confront false teaching and defeat it. Now, let me conclude with this. Next week, we'll begin our verse-by-verse -verse study of 1 Timothy. And every verse we're going to study. But with what little bit of time I've got left, I want to challenge you with something, and I want to ask you to read something with me in 1 Timothy chapter 2. There is a very powerful text, and all of the Bible is powerful. I realize that. But there is a very powerful couple of verses here that I want to leave you with as we go and as we finish. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Go down to verse 5. Let's read verses 5 and 6. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified 
in due time. He gave himself a ransom for all. Who was it? The man Christ Jesus. There is one God, one mediator between God and men. Any person, whoever you may be, who is seeking salvation, you're looking for forgiveness of your sins. You're looking for a way to have peace between you and God because you know that your life and your sin is separating you from God. You know that you haven't been saved. And if, I, if, that's, if those words are to you, and I'm speaking directly to you who might not be saved right now, you know it. God's speaking to your heart. He's showing you that you need to be saved. It says right here that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And he gave himself a ransom for all. He gave himself a ransom for you so that you can be saved. Just like I needed to be saved, and I could tell you, I could tell you every step of the way of how God prepared my heart for being saved when I was lost as a young man, and how God brought me to that point of, of trusting Jesus Christ as my Savior and becoming a born again child of God. I could, I could share that, and I may share it with you in, a, in the next a week or so or sometime. But you need to make sure that you've done that. And if you have not settled the account between you and God, and you haven't been saved yet, you need to do that. And I beg you, please, trust what Jesus did because he is the mediator between God and man. He is the only way to God. And he will... He, will make the, he makes the way open for you to come to God if you will just come trusting what Jesus did by dying on the cross for you then God will forgive you of your sins if you come to him through Jesus by trusting in Jesus please do that Christian if you've already been saved and that's why I call you Christian if you've been saved then I beg you stay faithful to God do what Timothy was encouraged by Paul to do. Stay faithful. Stay in the Word. Don't let this time of not attending church services let you become weak or backslid and get away from God. You won't lose your salvation, all right? That's not what happens. But your heart will become cold and sin will start dwelling in your life. You'll end up doing things you never thought you would do. So make sure you keep your heart right with God. Keep your sins confessed. Stay close to God. Stay in his word. Be faithful serving him. God bless you. Let's pray together and we'll end the service. Thank you so much, dear Father, for your goodness and faithfulness to us. And thank you for your word. Please work in our hearts now according to what you know we each individually need. In Jesus' precious name, amen.